a noble city known as the Riviera of the East. Once the jewel of Portugal's Eastern Empire is now an increasingly popular tourist destination. Rich ancient architecture and a venerable Catholic Hindu enclave. Its unique history and geography have left an indelible mark on its people over the generations. Travelers from all over the world come to this popular tourist place for relaxation. This is the perfect place for a holiday. Beaches, sun, sand, sea. But I'm here to eat my way through this gourmet paradise and of course not forgetting to do some cooking along the way. After 450 years of colonialism, the food here has absorbed a strong Portuguese influence. And this unique cuisine has evolved separately from the rest of India and is as casual and vivacious as the local people. I'm Angela May and this is Goa, a tropical paradise. Later on, Bobby Chin visits Manila, the capital city of the Philippines, and home to a cuisine influenced by another European culinary culture, that of Spain. But first, Angela May visits Goa, a colony of Spain's neighbor Portugal, for several hundred years. Goa is situated along the Arabian Sea on the west coast of India, and I begin my journey in the heart of its new capital, Panaji. Goa is an old Portuguese colony and there are many things still here reminiscent of the era. Although Portuguese colonialism was originally resisted, there is now historical pride in having Portuguese roots. Winding lanes are lined with Portuguese houses with distinctive red tiled roofs and plain whitewashed churches are tucked away in small alleyways. When old Goa grew unsanitary with disease and death in the 18th century, the Portuguese decided to shift the capital to here in Penangi. And all this walking around in old Goa has made me very hungry. I've come here to Cafe Bosley in the heart of Panjam City to kickstart my day with a breakfast. The most popular and famous Goan breakfast is Pau Baji. Everybody here is eating the stuff. Pau is Portuguese bread, and baji is a light vegetarian curry, and in this case, chickpea curry. Thank you. Okay, so the art of baking bread was brought here during the Portuguese rule, but now has obviously become a very important part of the Goan breakfast. The chickpea baji is really good. Nice, mild flavor, good for breakfast, but the bread, it's bread. I think I prefer the Punjabi-style puri, which is more like a roti that's been deep-fried. Well, every little village will have a guy that sells freshly baked pow on the back of his bike. How much for one? Two rupees one. Two rupees for one? I'll take two? Two, four rupees. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Freshly baked. This is the Sanctuary Bakery, established in 1856, one of the oldest establishments in Goa. Here, bread is made in the traditional clay oven. Okay, it seems like the guys over there are doing some type of grab and roll technique. I'm gonna try this as I make my own pow here. I think the irregular shape of the pow contributes to its look for it being handmade. Pow is part of the Portuguese Christian upper class diet and was basically eaten with breakfast, with mid-afternoon tea, at main meals as an accompaniment to chicken, meat, fish. It's basically become a go and essential. Built on the south bank of the Mandovi River, the town of Panaji officially became the capital of Goa in 1843 when old Goa was abandoned. And it's here I'm going to cook you a typical Goan breakfast dish. I'm here in Fontinas where you can find Portuguese influence in abundance. And this is where I'm going to make my mix, baji. And I've brought along my own pau, and I think this is gonna go very well with my dish. And of course, I'm gonna be putting my own twist on things. So first of all, for Goan food, what you would wanna do is you wanna make a masala paste. And I'm gonna use the traditional stone grinder to make the paste. I'm gonna put in the garlic, shallots, ginger, chilies okay and we'll add some freshly grated coconut for moisture and grind
in most Goan cuisine, you're gonna have to use a masala paste like this. This is gonna take me a while. Well, now this is looking just about right. Let's go ahead and leave this and we'll move on to the hot stuff. Now what we have here is a very hot pan and I'm just gonna add a little bit of oil and hope it doesn't splatter on us. Okay, that's enough oil for me. And since this is so hot, we'll just go ahead and add our masala paste in here immediately. We're just gonna let this fry off for a bit because we have the coconut that's been ground up and then it's in there. And that's gonna start releasing some oil, so that's gonna help us with the cooking process as well. So now I'm gonna add the vegetables. Now this dish usually just has potatoes and tomatoes in it. But of course, because I like vegetables and I'm making my own mixed baji, I'm going to add carrots and cauliflower. And now we add the peas. Just gonna give this a quick stir. And then we are going to move on to our dry ingredients. Okay, we have the garam masala. Of course, chili powder. Turmeric, ground coriander, it's a much. And then to round out the flavors, we're gonna add some sugar, get a nice caramel. And then I'm gonna add a tiny bit of salt to just help it along. And of course, tamarind that's been mixed with water. Give this a quick stir. And now I'm gonna add the water. We're gonna put in about a cup and a half in here. Get everything started along. Oh, it looks fantastic. And I'm going to put the lid on, and that'll cook for about 10 minutes until it's done. Ooh, that looks just about ready. And of course, I have my handy pal here. Ooh, that's hot. Mmm, very mild. Lots of vegetable flavor that's coming through. Mm. I'm leaving the busy city of Panaji and heading further south, inland, towards rural Panda. The main form of public transport largely consists of privately operated buses and auto rickshaws linking the major towns to the rural areas. However, one of the more relaxing ways to get around is by bicycle, and there are plenty of places to hire a bicycle in all major towns and beaches in Goa. The Goan mainland is often separated by rivers. Where bridges have not been built, the flat bottom ferries offer a cheap and popular way to get around. I've come to the sleepy little village in the south called Goa Villa to find out about the local all time favorite snack. I met up with Anthe, who still uses traditional methods in sausage making. This looks really spicy. The black pepper mm -hmm. and black chili. Black pepper and, and chilies go inside. Yeah. Those guys, that yeah. looks really difficult to do. You make you green malam? You make Can I do it? Yeah. I can come in? Yeah, come. Okay, yes uh, please. Yeah, come. You take the mixture and you push it into your intestine here. And then you start squeezing it down to make it go all the way through. <laughs> this is making some obscene noises. <laughs> it's all squishy and I'm playing with raw meat. <laughs> Once they have been made, the string of sausages are hung above the fire where they are gradually smoked. It is a century-old tradition of preserving meats without refrigeration, giving these sausages a shelf life of over eight months. Goan sausages are an essential ingredient in Goan cuisine and a must-have in every cupboard as it produces a wonderful dish on short notice for that unexpected guest. Mmm, that is perfect. It's so spiced. Oh, all the flavor is coming out. It's like a little explosion in my mouth. Oh, it's so lovely. Okay, thank you very much. Given that Goa has an ocean on one side and is crisscrossed by a maze of rivers, streams and canals, it is little wonder that fish is a Goan staple. The municipal 
market here in the heart of Panaji has fresh produce arriving daily and there are over a hundred varieties of freshwater and saltwater fish on offer. So now I don't know if you've noticed, but there's no men here selling fish. The stalls are all lined with women selling. That's because the men go out day and night and catch all of the fish while the women stay here and sell the produce that's been caught. seafood this fresh. Look at this shellfish over here. The size of these mussels. This is amazing. And this woman is just taking them, cracking them open, de-bearding them with a mussel shell. This is so fresh. The Goans love their fish and some of the most popular dishes are pan-fried rashad, where hot and spicy Goan masala is stuffed inside the fish and shallow fried until cooked. Calamari sabalis, using fresh squid, salt, vinegar, chili flakes, crushed pepper, then stir-fried until tender. And spiced butter crabs, which are cooked in crushed peppercorns, ginger, garlic, chilies, and tossed and fried until they turn pink. I meet up with Chef Ragu from the Taj Hotel Village, and he's going to treat me to a fishy delight, the most famous of all, Goan prawn curry. So, chef, tell me, what is a Goan curry? Curry is made up of, of different ingredients which are grown locally in our soil. Okay. Like, for example, the grated uh, the coconuts which are grown everywhere in Goa. Mm -hmm. Then we got the, the red chilies, tamarind, turmeric, coriander seeds, ginger, garlic, coconut, peppercorn, cumin seeds. So what is the difference between Goan cuisine and a lot of other cuisines? All the ingredients are ground together to become a very fresh, fine paste. Uh -huh. While other cuisine, they use mostly powders. Now, before I started cooking, I'll show you the prawns. After washing these prawns, just apply the salt and marinate it for about 15 minutes and keep it on the side. Take the ground paste and add it to the hot pan. Add a little water to it and simmer it for 15 minutes. It smells lovely already. Now I need, Angela, some onions to be chopped and cook the onions with the sauce for about five minutes. Without this curry, like prawn curry or fish curry, we can't survive. This is the most popular dish in our houses, every Goan houses. Now the sauce is ready, Angela. Now we can add the prawns to it. And just simmer the prawns just for four to five minutes so that it should remain very juicy when you're eating. Now we are going to add the slit chilies mm -hmm. and kokum to it. Oh, what is kokum? This is the kokum. It's a plum family. It's part of the plum family? Yeah. And you will not available, you will not find anywhere in parts of India. This is only grown in Konkan parts of Goa. Oh my goodness. It's, it's sour. very sour. <laughs> it's so sour. The chef adds the kokum, some salt, and stirs the curry for a few moments until the prawns turn pink. And the curry is ready now. It's ready? It's I cannot ready. help yeah, myself. Can I just go ahead and dig in? Ooh, it looks good. Mm. Prawns are tender and juicy. Turmeric flavor is very strong in the kokum. Mm. That is so nice, Chef. Mm. Fantastic. Goa is well known for mile upon mile of beautiful beaches. The emphasis here is very much on fun and relaxation. It's a place for winding down and enjoying life. This former Portuguese colony has retained the lifestyle of its colonial rulers with afternoon siestas, bohemian living, and a totally laid back attitude. I'm at one of the most popular beaches in Northern Goa, Baga Beach. Baga Beach is dotted with shacks that serve popular Goan snacks and dishes. Between Sinkarum and Baga, 
There are 180 food and drink shacks, and I'm going to see what all of the fuss is about. Oh, I see something yummy, and I just can't help myself. Excuse me, guys, your food looks so good. What did you order? Hi. These are all traditional bone dishes. Oh, it looks so fantastic. Would you like to maybe join us? Yes, please. Like, Can I? Of course. Thank you. So what do you guys have here? Well, this is a kingfish masala fry. It's a kingfish with traditional Goan spices. And uh, that over there is pork vindaloo. That's pork in a traditional vinegar sauce. And this here is chicken caffrel. It's uh, with mint sauce and uh, traditional Goan spices. Oh, Why don't you good. try some? Okay, I will. Thanks. So how do you like that? Mm. It's really good. It's refreshing and minty at the yeah, same time. Yeah, it's got a lot of minty taste in it, right? Yeah, it's one of our favorite fantastic. dishes here in Goa. Pretty much what we have here is what you'll get anywhere in Goa. Like, this is the stuff to eat when you're here. Yeah, but you're not going to get it this good. Yeah, you're not going to get this good. <laughs> mm, I want to try the kingfish. really good. It's actually made up of uh, rachada masala, which is a traditional Goan masala. It's mm -hmm. got uh, garam masala, some chili powder, and some sambar masala. This is the pork vindaloo? Yeah. Wow. It's really spicy and sour. Yeah, that's a lot of the Portuguese influence still left in that. They like they like the vinegar. They like it sour. So the taste is really strong. That could be helped with rice, though. Definitely with rice, you could just ask the cooks to make it a little less sour for you. It's fantastic. I think this is my favorite. How do you say it again? Chicken caffeira. Chicken caffeira. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Would you like to try some more of that? Yes, please. Yeah. Já fui aos Açores, sempre para deixo amor sem qualquer lugar. Meet Francisco Suaza. He plays typical faro music from the Portuguese colonial era, performed in a classic style. He's also the owner of one of the best and longest established restaurants in Goa, Casa Portuguesa. The food that Francisco serves at his restaurant is mainly Portuguese cuisine with a few Goan overtones. And he's going to show me how to make a typical Goan classic pork sopotel. A lot of the Portuguese cuisine that has been introduced in Goa actually has been influenced by Goan spices, mm -hmm. Goan chili. We use this, known as Kashmiri chilies, and we use this as well, a very hot local chilies. Mm -hmm. As compared to the Portuguese ones, that are mild, mm -hmm. and we use less of them. To add to it, we have a coconut vinegar that's used in Goa as compared to the wine vinegar in Portugal. Now it's back to the grindstone. Francisco takes some local dried chilies, cinnamon sticks, cloves, peppercorns, cumin seeds, and a splash of coconut vinegar and grinds the mixture into a fine chili paste. And as Francisco gets his hands dirty with the chili paste, he gets me to dice the fatty boiled pork into small pieces. And over a wood fire stove, he cooks the fatty pork pieces without using any oil. He then adds some diced pig's kidneys and fries the pieces until crisp. And at the same time, the oil that emanates from it, uh -huh. I'm going to use it for frying onions, the garlic, Ooh. ginger. After sweating the onion, ginger, and garlic, he adds the chili paste made earlier, cooks it for a while, and drops in the fried pork in kidney cubes. So how long are we going to fry the pork in the sauce? Just a couple of minutes now. Mm -hmm. And then I shift it to the next container. And then we do a slow cook. And the slow cooking until it's all ready. It's fantastic. Francisco adds some water to the pan, mixes all those flavors in, and pours the juices into the clay pot. He then adds some slit green chilies, stirs them in, and lets the whole thing cook for 45 minutes or so. Oh, it's ready. I can't wait to taste it. All right, here we go. Perfect. Okay. Oh, great. Not too hot. Mmm. The pork is so tender. Oh, it's so flavorful and tangy, and mm, the sauce thickened up as well. Oh, that's so good. Uh, how do you like it? Mm. Uh. Mm. Goa is 
not all about the traditional, though. Here one can find a whole host of international cuisines, mainly because of the vast number of tourists coming here. The Restaurant Francais is one such example, but it has a very unique twist that sets it apart from other places selling European food. I meet up with Morgan, trained in classical French cuisine. He's been running La Restaurant Francais for the last 10 years in the heart of Baga. This is the dish where we have the most Cohen influence with the Portuguese bacalao that we used to serve with the mint coulis around it. I love how you've taken something very classical and then still mixed in influences from the country that we're in. Yeah, I mean, we get a lot of dishes here which are, you know, inspired by, you know, we're so close to Asia, so we have a little touch of wasabi here, and then we have the Portuguese bacalao here, and then here we get the tuna served rare like the Japanese do, so we have a whole mixture, and we like to play around with things very much in this restaurant. I mean, uh, nothing is I love the playfulness, but you stayed very true to French cuisine using the techniques and the food is just lovely. Mm. I'd say this is the main thing that we use here is the French techniques, mm -hmm. but then we apply them onto the Goa, Goan ingredients, mm -hmm. you know, and try and play around with what they have here, but really using the essence of, you know, what the what they've taught me in school basically, you know, right. all the fond de cuisson and all the fond de boeuf and all that crazy things that the mm -hmm. psycho chefs have just hammered into my <laughs> head, you know. But you know, at the end of the day it's it's really been useful, you know. It's amazing how you actually come back to your first lessons of cooking and come out with a brandad and, uh, you know, 8,000 miles away, you know, what to do. Has living in Goa changed you? Very much, very much. I have an Indian accent now, so that is, you know, that is one thing. But uh, I think coming from my team in the kitchen, they have changed me a lot. And that is, I think, my biggest achievement, not only to put up a, a French restaurant here, but to have taught them how to cook this kind of food. Sounds so rewarding. Yeah, no, but it's great. It's great. It's just fun, you know, it's just fun. And uh, you need fun. If you're working, you got, you're under pressure, you're in a restaurant, you, you want to get out the dishes fast, and at the same time, you're having fun. I mean, you know, go and ask in a French restaurant, who's having fun in a French restaurant? Nobody. Come to go <laughs> anytime. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Nightlife in Goa is always buzzing, and I'm gonna go check out the scene. But if you're like me and you're scared of these Goan roads, you can always hire your own personal pilot taxi. Excuse me, our poor market? Yes, madam. Ever since the hippies made Goa their hangout zone, partying has come to be an integral part of life. Nightclubs, karaoke bars, and shacks serving great food line roadsides in the north of Goa. Our poor market is held every Saturday night. It's a vibrant, colorful, and bustling night market that runs through to the early hours of the morning. Not only are locals hawking goods, but there are all types of people from across the globe selling almost anything and everything. And right in the heart of the market is where you'll find the food stalls, serving not only local delicacies, but also favorites from all over the world. This place is absolutely off the hook. Everything you want can be found here. Let's go look at some food. Oh my goodness, that looks good. Doesn't that look great? <laughs> Chinese chicken and rice here. And this guy has rice as well. A lot of Chinese in this market. Beans. Uh, food. It's very healthy food. And this is soya. So this is all vegetarian food. That looks fantastic. Okay, now I'm about to now, burn my tongue. Yeah, don't yeah. burn your tongue. It's going to be really hot. <laughs> mm. How is it? That it's fabulous. Yeah, good. Thank you. So I'm try one. Have fun. <laughs> Goa is a literal melting pot of people and cultures, and we all know that I love my melting pots. The relaxed attitude and laid-back atmosphere have completely stolen my heart, and I, like many of the people here, will find it very hard to leave. I'm Bobby Chin, chef, restaurateur. I'm going to find out the fusion and the confusion of the cuisine here. It's got to be Manila. With more than 16 million people sharing the packed streets of the 17 cities that make up Metro Manila, this place sure does pack a punch for the unprepared. This is Plaza Miranda in Capo Square. This is the melting part of it all. 
over there, you've got the church. Down over there, you've got Chinese merchants selling smoked fish. You got a large Muslim community, and you got a lady here selling halal spaghetti. I thought I saw it all. Some of the street food here is just as challenging to the sensibilities. Like day old chicks. That is not enjoyable. Chicken intestines. It's got a colonic. It didn't get a colonic. Or the local delicacy of balut, which is an 18 day old fertilized duck embryo. Please. Is this good for me in any way? I think it's the idea of eating an 18-day-old embryo. Just a little guilty. It's, it's kind of strange. With its unique mix of Chinese, Indian, Japanese, Mexican, American, and especially Spanish influences, Filipino cuisine is known for its bold combinations of sweet, salty, and sour flavors. Because the cuisine here has had a strong Spanish bias since they colonized this place in 1521, the unceasing march of the Chile across Southeast Asia never got a foothold here. My first port of call is the farmer's market. I love it here. It's full of fantastic fresh produce and the kind of place any chef could spend hours just wandering around. It was here I met Roland Ladico. He's one of the new breed of Filipino chefs who are pushing the boundaries of the traditional cuisine. He agreed to show me how to cook a seafood sinigang, which is famous for its sour taste and the large variety of ingredients you can use to make it. It's really big. It's like, okay. nice. All right, so now we need this fish. Yeah, meron kayo yung tanig belly, in detail? Ito, may belly. Yeah, magkano? How much? 250. 250? Yes. 250. Not bad. We're gonna use this one, Bobby. Okay. It's, it's called tanig here. It's like our local mackerel. All right. If I didn't have mackerel, what would I use? Uh, well, we have a fish called Maya Maya. Mahi Mahi. No, not Mahi Mahi. Maya Maya. It's Maya, different. Maya Maya Maya. Maya 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 so we're, we're looking for some nice vegetables for our sinigang. A bit of tomatoes. Yeah. Meron kayong mas sinog na kamatis? Wala na, gato. And then we're gonna use this too. These are green chilies. They're not as spicy as the, you know, like the Thai bird type chilies. Like those puppies. Yeah, these ones, these, these ones are spicy. Labanos, radish. Meron kayong labanos? Labanos. Yeah, one huh? is okay, this one. Tamarind, there you go. Okay. We use tons of different sour ingredients. Okay. Any, actually, any sour ingredient okay. other than vinegar we use for sinigang. Like now this is a great idea. This part of the market is called a dampar. You can bring the ingredients you just bought to these kitchens where they will cook it to your instructions. Or in our case, we're taking this kitchen over. Ah, the power of television. All right, we're all, we're all set here. Uh, we're cooking is seafood sinigang. All right, so I want you to peel it and then just cut it. So the first thing we need to do is to boil these suckers. You know, this is a fresh tamarind. You need to wash the rice to get rid of the impurities. The sour taste imparted by Roland's use of tamarind is typical of Filipino cuisine. Put in the onions like that. Everything is dumped in. It's very easy. Pop in the tamarind pulp and it's this is at this stage it's really sour. Yeah. I can confirm that it's sour. So you need to strain this out and. While that's simmering, you can actually put in the seafood at this point. The fish goes in first. You don't want it to overcook. And this fish tends to be dry if it's overcooked. Try to squeeze in all these giant, well, they're so huge, they can't, they can't fit anymore. <laughs> so it takes like maybe another 15 minutes. At this point, you want to take out the fish and the prawns because you don't want to overcook it. Okay. It tends to be dry if it's too... There we go. Wow, the prawns looks... That's beautiful. Wow. You want to just put it there and then we're going to pop in all the okay. veggies. That is very sour. It's good for a sore throat. <laughs> yeah. That's what this is for. Yeah. <laughs> Like it? It's good, yeah. Yeah, but we need to see. It builds it on you, it. actually. At the first step, I was yeah. thinking, you know, yeah, then what's we the put, fuss? We put in all these uh, nice green chilies. And lastly, the fish sauce. You have to be careful when you add fish sauce. It's really potent. Yeah. Just 
just want to make sure that I can repeat this because, you know, it's one of those dishes that you actually need someone to show you. It's like writing poetry of love and never being in love. Huh. <laughs> wow. Just like that? I just let it simmer for a while, soften the Kong Kong. Done. That's excellent. Actually, that's not spicy. Tamarind and okra is a marriage made in heaven. Roland took me back to his restaurant to show me how he puts a fusion twist on some traditional Filipino cuisine, including his version of sinigang, which involves pouring hot coconut cream with lemongrass over cold jellified sinigang soup, all served up in a martini glass. And then when you scoop in the gelatin melts. sinigang, and then you eat it, then it melts. Very interesting. You like it? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Next, I headed to Intramuros. It's the old walled city built by the Spanish who ruled here for 333 years. Local guide Carlos Seldron took me first to Fort Santiago. This is the former palisaded fort of a sultan named Raja Sulaiman because Manila was formerly Islamic before it became Catholic. So from around the 16th century until around the early 19th century, Intramuros was really a repository of treasures. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're looking at seven churches and seven churches that were housing treasures coming from the East and the West. Mm -hmm. So we had porcelain here, we had Italian chandeliers here, we had uh, Mexican silver and Mexican gold in Manila. Mm -hmm. So you can see that's how the personality of the city came about from because it was all this good stuff from all the corners of the globe, all meeting in one area. Here we are now at the Pasig River. And this is really the lifeblood of the city of Manila. It is the source of Manila. Uh -huh. Because the, the city itself gets its name from the river. My Nila comes from two words, my Nila, which means there are water lilies. So the city itself derives its name from the river. If Egypt's got its Nile, we've got the Pasig. From the fort, we went to St. Augustine's, which is the oldest church standing in the Philippines. The Spanish culture that the priests brought over with them even influences the way that we eat. Because Spanish cuisine will always be the court cuisine in this country. Royal cuisine in the Philippines is Spanish cuisine. For a birthday or for Christmas, you'll get paella or chocolate or a roasted pig. Filipino food as we know it, like adobo, has become comfort food. It's the food of the everyday, the food of the familiar, mm -hmm. the food that you serve your family. And then there's the last part of Philippine food, which I find really the best part, the most interesting, is Philippine street food. Yeah. Which is like our soul food. Okay. And here you can see evidence of the Catholic background, wow. the oldest stone church in the Philippines, the San Agustin Church, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But everything you see around you is an illusion, though. I mean, if you take closely at the roof and the wall, the ceiling and the walls, you're looking at uh, trompe l'oeil, paintings that fool the eye. Nothing is three-dimensional. It was all done by Italian scenic designers from an opera house in Milan in the 19th century. So you can see a lot of Filipino cultures about East and West, Europe smashing into Asia. It's like getting a lot of cultures in the world, putting into a blender and pressing frappe. There are buildings with a Spanish influence everywhere you look in Intramuros. I found a quiet little courtyard to cook my Spanish influence dish with chocolate, which they brought over from South America. Okay, for my second dish I'm gonna cook is called champarado, which is a breakfast dish. Very easy to make. Uh, the ingredients are sticky rice, and I've soaked it overnight, uh, chocolate, brown sugar, a reduced milk, and then it's actually garnished, believe it or not, with a dried salted fish, which is fried in oil. I'm gonna take this water, I'm gonna pour it into the chocolate, pour the rice in. And what this dish is, is actually, it's kind of like a congee, uh, Chinese porridge. Okay, just give it a little stir. Okay, let's add the chocolate. And you can add as much sugar as you want. You want it real sweet and you want your kids crawling up the walls, go right ahead. Now, this dish should be rich. So, there's never too much chocolate, okay? You want it a nice, dark color. All we have to do now is pretty much wait until it's a gruel. This should take about 30 minutes to cook until it becomes a porridge. Put oil. So it's 
it's actually a fried fish here. And they eat the whole, the whole thing. Scales, head and all. That's the Chinese in them. Yep, let it all bubble up. You can make this as thick or as thin as you like. And they like to garnish with this milk here. It's not a condensed milk, but I think condensed milk would be fine. Like a moat. Yes, like a moat. It's a crispy fish on top. And then right here. It was so gingerly. Temperado, a classic Filipino dish served for breakfast. The Americans had military bases in the Philippines up until the mid 1990s, and their influences are everywhere, from the music and sports to their food. Another influence Americans left behind is the jeepney. Hey! Okay, so here's what they did. They took the jeep, they extended it by a couple of meters, and they converted it into this modern means of transportation. Holds up to 20 people and doesn't cost that much money. I don't understand what I got here. I got a driver, an accountant, and an announcer. Is that what I got or what I got? Usually the driver yeah. and his marker. He's his marker? Barker. Barter. His barker. His barker. Yeah. He's on the rights the barker. Who collects the money? The barker? Can be both. I, any of them. The pollution in Manila is so bad that after half an hour on that jeepney, my eyes were stinging and I had a throbbing headache. Maybe this is the answer. An electric jeepney. It's quite a big difference in terms of the noise, the pollution, and also even the, the smooth ride is very different. It's nice to get the, the smooth ride, but it's still got the same air. Well, from outside, yes. Right. So we're working that all our electric jeepneys will be powered um, from renewable energies. That's great. I'm really happy to hear that because, you know, in Asia, um, everyone seems to not really care about the environment so much. Slowly but surely, we're trying to educate people that, you know, in our own little way, we can, we can do something for our environment. This electric jeep meet took me all the way to one of Manila's most popular spots. Manila's changing quickly, rapidly moving to a mall culture, and people used to eat on the streets are now eating in food courts. They eat at malls, they shop at malls, they hang out at malls, and this one here has its own 12-lane freeway. Third largest in Asia, SM Mall of Asia. There are more than 600 shops spread over an area of 407,000 square meters. This place is nearly a kilometer long, and on a busy day, they welcome a half a million customers. They even have an Olympic ice skating ring inside the mall. Street food culture in Manila is rapidly moving into these vast food courts. This food court is packed, and the restaurants that are all busy are Filipino restaurants. So here you've got a Filipino, Asian, Chinese type of place. You've got lichon Cebu, which is roasted uh, pig from Spain. Then you've got sinigang, which is a classic dish I cooked with Roland. Over here moving, once again, kind of like a more Chinese influence, but it's got that Filipino twist somehow. And then over here, more Filipino food. And look at, they're all just crowding all up there. And then you got Fat Boy's Pizza. Obviously, the Americans were here. And then keep on, and where does it end? Right here, more Filipino food. Although these food courts are becoming ever more popular, you can still find more traditional restaurants like this one, where I went to cook chicken adobo, which is considered the national dish. Adobo is a Spanish word, which refers to a vinegar-based stewing sauce. I'm here with Chef Jean Gonzalez, who is a chef extraordinaire of Filipino cuisine, who actually has a culinary school as well as a restaurant. And we got the pressure because you got all your students there, so uh, we got to do this right, I think. We'll start with the um, oil and lightly brown the garlic. 
So uh, I'm going to pound the lemongrass to, to uh, release the flavor. So it's time to put the chicken. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just before we put the fish sauce in, let's put in some lemongrass. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so you can put your pepper now. There you go. There you go. And that's kind of like to punctuate it, not, uh -huh. to, uh, not to season it. Uh -huh. put the, you uh, can put the um, fish sauce. Great. And uh, you can put the vinegar in too. Right, now this is the part that becomes tricky. This is the okay. part in which those students over there would sit there and say, you don't know how to make an adobo because it's got to reduce, it's got to have the right acidity. <laughs> They're laughing. No, Your students are laughing. You can do it, Bob. You can do it. Of course you can do it. Okay, so the vinegar? Now the vinegar. Now you don't, touch, you don't want to touch that now. All you got to do is just let the uh, acidic aromas evaporate and you got your basic adobo. So, we, you got that caramelized thing in the bottom, right? Hold on, you got to watch here. See that right there? See that right there? See those colors? See that? That's what we're looking for. And that's what we're looking that's for. That flavor goes back to the chicken. Yeah. Gives the color to the chicken. Okay, so you can see the chicken has taken on to a light gold color. Yeah. And some stock, chicken stock. So Bobby, we add a pinch of sugar just to round out the flavor. Mm -hmm. There you go. Maybe we should add a little chili. Egg. I think that's appropriate. It, it, it's a slimming aid, yeah. and it, it's very high in vitamin C. I just put the top on, and we just All let right. it simmer for, All what, right. 10 minutes? Yeah, another 10 to 12 minutes. OK. So this is it. Oh. Hey, look at that. Oh, they're clapping already, easy, Bobby. Easy, easy. Hey, come on, they're clapping I just put already. It, no, I just took the lid off. Here we go. Chicken and double with lemongrass. Great, great, Bob. Great. Now this I do like. Escalito's Saturday morning market is the brainchild of several residents of the surrounding high-rise apartments who wanted a reason to get out and meet each other. It has turned into one of the best places to buy food from all the various provinces of the Philippines. I was shown around by a local food expert and blogger who goes by the name of Market Man. More people have modern lives, the less likely they are to cook. But what I'd really like for them to know is the original sort of ways of preparing these dishes and they're not lost. Yeah. So we're going to pick up a few things um, for the snack that we're going to have this afternoon on Merienda. Merienda? What is what is? It, it's an afternoon snack, but uh -huh. then I think we've evolved that into a snack in the morning and in the afternoon and in the early evening. It's but Spanish. Spanish, yeah, that's what they absolutely. Do. It's just let's take a break and have so, a little... So here they have some nice paella, which is sort of the Spanish, the Spanish uh, influence on the cuisine. Uh -huh. So they're already pre-cooked. You this can is come squidding. In. Yeah, this is squidding. Is that, would the Spanish be happy with that paella? Or would they say, ah, oh, it's a Filipino paella, not the um, I think back. they'd be pretty happy with this. That's, That's kind of different. Yeah, it's a roast calf. It's a whole roast calf. Vegetarian shit show. So, yeah. It's basically uh, done the same way you do uh, a roast pig. Yeah. You don't have the crickets? We do have also the crickets. Oh, we have crickets. These are the rice field crickets. Rice field crickets. Oh, rice field crickets. Yes. yes. That's the ones I was looking for. <laughs> yes. Oh, let me try those. Yeah, you eat it with rice. Is that like what's that? Is that a whole? Oh, that's too little. Oh, that's a lot. Nice. Mm, it's really good. Really? I'm trusting you for some reason. Smile. You've got a good smile, buddy. No, it is really good. No, no, it's a little crunchy. Crunchy. They taste like shrimp. Yeah. Yeah. It's starting yeah. to make me question whether I should be eating shrimp anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no. Actually, that is good. A lot of the food in the country is really influenced by Filipinos going abroad and bringing food back. So you'll find uh, um, there'll be Middle Eastern dishes, and there'll be Chinese dishes, there'll be Western dishes, and you can get a little bit of everything in this market. Yeah, it's glutinous rice, and they put it in this thing, and it goes into the steamer for a few minutes. Okay, now who invented this? Because this looks kind of like a rustic uh, I piece think of it's, cooking. It goes back pretty much a couple of hundred years here. Yeah. From Escalito 
it was back to Market Man's house for my first ever Marianda. There really is something quintessentially Spanish about these decadent afternoon get-togethers. Many of these desserts were done during the Spanish period, late uh -huh. 1700s, early 1800s, uh -huh. in areas that had a lot of sugar. So they went overboard in sugar? Absolutely. We now have this sweet tooth, a national sweet tooth. Yeah. The thoughts that are running through my head as I put this in a glass is that if this does not give me a speed rush, I don't know what will. Buzz is what it is. It's a sugar rush. Oh, it's great. It's about to go in there. I'm wired right now. Ooh. They should serve these before a marathon. I, I think the sugar's kicked in. Yeah. I think it's time for me to go.